With that being said, uh, the second question is, what does it take to prepare a sermon three times a week? Yeah, great question. You know, so I've been um, pastoring now going on probably maybe 15 years. You know, right now at this point in my life, I'm preparing Sunday school and then three sermons each week. There's been other times where um, I would preach Sunday morning, teach Sunday school, preach Sunday night, uh, lead a devotion for prayer meeting on Monday, preach on the radio Monday, Wednesday night. So there's and then teach a you know college course. So there's been other times where I've had to prepare six times each week. You know, um, I, I don't think there's any set amount of hours that it takes to prepare. But I will just say this. When I first met Jesus at 21 years old, I just devoured the scripture. I mean, I spent, I didn't watch TV. If I listened to the radio, it was sermons. Lunch break, I'd read my Bible. Uh, Mid-afternoon break at work, I'd read my Bible. I'd come home from work, read my Bible. I'd lay in the bed at night, read my Bible. I'd wake up in the morning, read my Bible. I mean, I devoured the word. I was so hungry for the word. I wasn't married. I didn't have a girlfriend, no children. I had all the time that I wanted to give to the scripture. And just to be very, very clear about it, I did not waste time. I read the scripture and that developed in me a very solid foundation from the first day I got saved. I was told, read the scripture, read the Bible, read the Bible. And I'm telling you, for the first four years, you know, I got saved. Uh, a year later, I went to Bible school and stayed in the Scripture, stayed in the Scripture. That's the only thing I fed myself. No secular music, no secular TV, nothing. I was just all consumed with the Scripture. It was like honey to me. It was like water to my soul. It was so needful in my life. Those years have been the foundation of every sermon I've ever prepared. I don't really know any other way to say that. So when I first got saved, I had this amount of time and I used it. I studied words. I studied Bible characters. I studied history. I studied the different genres of scripture, the context of scripture, the homiletics, hermeneutics, just study, study, read books about it. Then I got married in the time that I had to study and prepare it got cut in half i mean you get married your spouse they're half of your life you know then i had children mm -hmm. and then my time to prepare and study got this thin <laughs> razor thin and yeah. then i pastored a church <laughs> yeah. and my time to prepare went where there's the time is very challenging so now I prepare messages as they come. You know, I don't prepare 10 in advance, you know. So uh, Monday I'll begin praying, Lord, what's the message for Wednesday? I'll read daily devotions. I read through the Bible in a year. I'm just reading through. So I read my daily devotions. If a thought jumps out, on Monday, if, a, if, if something stands out to me, I'll just make a note of that, but I don't use my devotion time for sermon preparation. I'll just keep reading my devotion time. Yeah. Like you leave it off to the side, leave it later. off to the side for later. Just yeah. make a note of that because I'm praying, Lord, what's your message for these people Wednesday night? Yeah. Um, and so as I prepare, as I study a thought or two, would just stand out in my daily devotion. And uh, I set aside time in the afternoons on Monday to actively study for Wednesday night. Sometimes I'm not sure what direction I'm going. So I'm asking the Lord, what's the need of the people? So I would say, first of all, it takes prayer, asking the Lord for direction. Number two, when scripture just jumps out at me and speaks to my need, I make a note of that because if it's speaking to my need, Usually God allows the pastor to sense the people's needs through his own needs. And if it's ministering to me, I know God's going to use it to minister to the people. And so I'll make a note of that. 
And then on Tuesday afternoon, I began studying out those things that God just kind of highlighted, highlighted in my own heart. And as I'm studying those things out, I'll read them in context. I'll read them in the context of the chapter, the context of the book. And I'll make the notes around that, that maybe uh, key text or that topic. Sometimes I'll preach topical. Most of the time I usually preach verse by verse through a portion of scripture. And when I finish, sometimes on Wednesday, I'll have prepared two or three messages. And as I pray over those messages, I'll think, no. Yeah, the list there is down. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's no water in that well. Mm-hmm. And I'll pray about this one. No, there's no, there's no rain in that cloud. And then I'll say, Lord, this is just kind of where I believe you're going. I've prepared the message. I've studied the context. I've looked at the application for the people that I'm pastoring. Lord, if this is not the message, you're going to have to show me. But I'm trusting you for this day. And then I do the same thing Thursday, Friday, Saturday uh, for Sunday's messages. So a lot of, I would say a large percentage of my week goes into thinking about the sermons for the week, reading for the sermons of that week, and study of the sermons that week. Yeah. So it is a large percentage of my mental, emotional uh, capacity that week. Yeah. I, I remember when you first came here, and there is one particular issue that we could bring up while, during this question uh, that happened to you not too long ago. But uh, one thing that you always stressed was that, you know, preaching and messages are something that God builds in your life rather than sitting down one day and then just God giving you the thought. Yes. And, uh, you know, I've been preaching here since I was 11 years old, so about 11 years now. Yeah. And... Um, one thing that I always did, you know, I've already said behind the pulpit kind of my call to preach and where that came from was, you know, I just asked the Lord, where do you want me to mm-hmm. preach from? What's the word that you want? You know, where where do you want to use me? You know, and what do you want me to say? And then it's almost like the Lord leads me to something like you said that I was studying or something like that. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, I'm not married or anything like that. Uh, but you're right about the time mm. differential. I've seen that. You know, when I was in high school, uh, in middle school, really, when I was 11 till I went to college, I had nothing but time yeah. to be able to study and do all those things. I didn't have a job. You know, I had all those things going on. And uh, you're right. Your time. I mean, I had so much time. I was able to go into like these in-depth studies yes. and and really dive into things, even things that. I mean, all the scripture matters, but topics that weren't necessarily primary topics. Yes. And, and I love to do that, and I still love to do stuff like that because I guess I'm what you'd probably call a Bible nerd. But when I got to Bible college, and I had many opportunities to preach there, which cut down time, like you're saying. And then uh, we were so busy where we had jobs, and I had college and all this stuff going on. And you think at Bible college, oh, well, that's the same thing as what you're talking about. That's where all that time comes from. No. Yeah. No way at all. I mean, it's about like, because you're serving it to church there. You're doing all this stuff. And I I praise the Lord for that. And I think that that is a big part of a preacher's life and a a pastor's life. Yes. Uh, But it does. It cuts down. Doing stuff for the church cuts down on your personal relationship time with Jesus just because... It, even if you're doing stuff for him is yes. different than Being spending that with personal him. time with yes. him. Yeah. And even today, mm-hmm. you're still like me. You're able to draw from those in-depth studies. Like you, yeah. the I believe the depth of our study in our younger years, we draw from that our whole ministry. Oh, yeah. And that's why when men and women get saved, if they don't give the scripture priority, I believe it can create a distorted or limited pool of yeah. knowledge. I can see that. And so as we study, like we're talking, not everybody has that privilege. Some get saved older in life. But I believe the depth of our study determines that pool 
that we draw from our whole ministry. Yeah. Now we have to keep adding to that, or that will run dry. Oh yeah. Um, but you know, like for example, um, this coming Wednesday, I'm not preaching this Wednesday. Pastor Dwight is, but oh, good. Um, well, but, not that you're not preaching, yeah, but but this past Sunday. So I always say this in a joking way, but I'm serious. This past Sunday, I preached two, uh, one sermon because the evening we had a special service. Um, that that March fifth, I've been saved twenty years. Coming up here next month, so I always joke and say, "Yeah, that sermon Sunday took me nineteen years and three hundred and fifty days to prepare." Yeah, you know, because I believe that our life prepares the sermon. Um, and so, you know, I, I think everything goes into the sermon. What's happening in your marriage can go into the sermon. What's happening with your children? One of the members here gave me a cup and it said, Pastor, warning. <laughs> Anything you say could be shared about you in a sermon. Yeah. You know, I, I don't usually do that without permission. Um, no, it's only your kids that you do without that's permission. That's right. That's think, exactly yeah. right. Yeah, I uh, I noticed that about you from the get go, uh, and then on a practical level, just from outside looking in, you had like more or less a database of all these studies that you had done. Yes, you know, I when I was younger, you know, it was before I really learned how to do anything with a computer. We didn't really computers were not even big yeah. then, which I'm I'm sure you're familiar with too, but. But being a kid also and not really growing up in the richest area, you didn't really have access to like technology mm -hmm. and, and flash drives and all that yeah. kind of stuff. So everything that I did is mostly on paper yeah. that I find I find at random times when I'm trying to clean a room or something like yeah. that. But one thing that you've done or tried to do uh, was give yourself basically this online database of all these things and all these studies that you yes. have. Um, like I saw it before it got deleted, mm -hmm. so kind of, kind of to jump forward, yeah. it was accidentally deleted, um, <laughs> and it was just so it was not really funny in the moment, but uh, it was funny to me because I'd always seen him kind of pull from that. Not that like you're phoning it in from Absolutely. all these years, yes. but like you said, having that well to draw from. That's right. Uh, would you have any words to say about has that changed how you prepare a message or has that changed how you develop your messages not having that physical copy of yeah. things like you did before so you know before like i mentioned when i would have three messages prepared i probably write five to seven messages every week i, I, I write them um, they may not be fully developed. It may just be an idea. It may just be the skeleton outline. It may just be the illustration. But normally in my study time, I'll prepare five to seven messages every week. And I put all of them in folders, you know, in the past. I've put them in certain folders by topic. Faith, prayer, tongues, healing, baptism, ordination, leadership, uh, soul winning, missionary, preaching, what, whatever, I have just folders, on, you know, and I'll just drop those in. Because, you know, I may prepare five sermons this week, but I'll preach three of them. That And I won't preach the next two next week. They're just not hot, you know? Yeah. Uh, when you write them, they're hot, you know? And, yeah. Uh, oh, but yeah. then they cool off. They seem to cool off. And then later, as God burdens me about that topic, you know, I can go back and pull from that. Um, now, a lot of that was lost. Mm -hmm. um, I was able to recover some fragments of that. I've started rebuilding that. Um you know, I would say that one thing that it's caused me to do is not rely so much on past work, you know, because um, that can be a temptation the longer yeah. you've been in ministry. Sure. And I, I was challenged one time because I, I, there was a time I never preached a message twice. I just always was preaching new messages. And... Um, uh, one day a man challenged me. He said, look, you know, if God gave you the message, it's good for all time. And, you know, singers sing the same song. Um, so I have here at Capital City Baptist Church, I've preached three sermons here twice. 
the exact same sermon. Nobody may remember, um, but I've preached three sermons on purpose, the exact same sermon in my almost four years here. Yeah. Um, I, in Kentucky, I pastored there a little over seven years, never preached the same sermon twice. Um, but it was needful that I preached th- those messages. Again, I just felt God burned me. To oh, yeah. Them. Well, Peter, I believe somewhere, I think it was him, he said that it's important that I call you to remembrance That's certain right. things. That's exactly right. Uh, and, and just because you preach the same message, even if you have the same outline, yes. unless you're a robot, which <laughs> I, you thought I was for a while, yeah. I still wasn't the particular that, that much. It's like what you said, you know, the, the preacher, the one that preaches – is a part of the message. It's yes. not just the words. Like, you know, if you gave me your sermon outline, it doesn't matter different. if I even tried to copy you That's because right. it would be totally different. That's right. The preacher that you were when you preached it the first time is not the preacher that you are Absolutely. the second time. And the context is different. The world's different. You yes. know, like the church is in a different place. Oh yeah. The so I preached I preached out um Sunday morning. Yes. Uh for a pastor friend. I I hope that uh, he watches this but um the message that I preached at his church, I preached at our church, mm-hmm. which there's no overlay anyway. Sure. But um, it was different than yeah. it was uh, whenever it was there. And and so what I did was I had that sermon written down. I had it uh, in my my vault, I guess, or my well, if you could put it that way. And the night before, I was pouring over it because I felt like that's the subject matter the Lord wanted me to do. And then I re I had the, a new document and the old document together, and I just started putting all this mm-hmm. stuff in and, and changing it up and adapting it. Not even necessarily because the words were wrong in the message, but because how I thought about it or, or who I was or the circumstances now were different than they were back when I first yeah. taught the message. And I, I think that that is a key component to that. Yeah. Uh, I I know that you've preached certain messages more yeah. than once, especially being the person that kind of listens and yes. redoes the audio yes. and, and her, hears the message probably more than most people do yeah. a week. Uh, you really pick up on certain phrases that you yes. say or certain things that you do. Uh, now I want to say this too, um, you know, especially if there's a young pastor or someone about to go into the ministry, there are times where I believe I miss the Lord mm-hmm. on on messages and. There are some services where I go in going, Lord, I have no idea what what yeah. to preach. And this happened just a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's not that I don't prepare. I prepare. Um, there's very rarely ever a, a service I go to that a lot of prayer and time had went into preparation. But I still sometimes can come to the singing hour and still not know what I'm going to preach. And that's a very uh, vulnerable place to be it in. Is. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I don't know if you noticed, but I took the pulpit and uh, I I took two Bibles up there with me. I did not know what to preach. I took two Bibles and my iPad and I was asking for testimonies because I could not get a read on where God... Some more yeah, I couldn't tell where God yeah. wanted me to be. And that day I preached uh, a message on um, when Jacob was returning to meet Esau. Mm-hmm. That message I preached, I that wasn't even on my radar. But it's where I just ended up when it was time to preach. Oh yeah. And so, you know, that if you're out there listening and if you're a young pastor or if you're, you know, just now being called to the ministry, don't get this romanticized idea that you're gonna feel like you're walking on clouds every sermon. Right? Yeah. It's safe to oh, say yeah. that because Sometimes we just don't know. And there's sermons, there's services I've left. And I thought to myself, God, I laid an egg on that one. Yeah. Not that I didn't perform the sermon well. I just didn't feel like it connected with the people that moment. Yeah. You know, some people say I laid an egg because they didn't perform well in their preaching. Performance has nothing to do with preaching. Personality has nothing to do with the power of the message. It's the, I believe, the preacher, his heart, the people's heart. And the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit yeah. working in the hearts of everyone. It brings that connection where the message is received and responded to. Um, it doesn't fall on faithless ears. Um, and so some, when I say, man, I laid an egg on that one. 
What I mean by that is, man, the message and the members didn't connect. Yeah. There wasn't a connection there. And it happens that way. It doesn't mean God's not working. His word never returns void. That's right. That's right. But, and I don't measure that by the altar call. I don't measure that by hands raised. I measure it by the spiritual temperature of the room. You can sense a spiritual coldness. Oh, yeah. You can sense a spiritual indifference. You can spend, You can sense a spiritual expectancy. You know of those things. So, um, but that's just a little on just sermon preparation and even serving delivery there. Yeah, I think that uh, in my partic my particular uh, walk with the Lord, in that it's hard. Some the, the the hardest thing for me to determine is like there have been times where it feels like it kind of didn't land but then you find out later that that it was almost like they were just in deeper thought about it yes you know? like i've had that happen a considerable amount of times where i've just preached and, it, and it's you know and i don't know if it's because when i was younger we had more of like a camp mm -hmm. meeting style and yes. maybe i'm just used to to feeling that out rather than kind of where we are now yeah uh but it's like, well, okay, there wasn't much of a response, and you know, it, and it's not preaching for a response. Sure. Um, whenever I preach, it has nothing to, like I don't really care necessarily about how they feel about it because I'm given the message that I feel like the Lord wants right. to do. But I also am trying to feel out whether or not that's what the Lord had for them. That's you know, right. I that's, understand. A, that's a hard distinction to make sometimes. But uh, in in this particular way, uh, a lot of the the teens have t totally got this way. I think they're they're very reserved in, in yes. how they do. So, you know, like if I'm talking to them in in person, uh, in public, or something like that, even they're real open about certain things. But then as soon as you begin to like preach and really get down into things, they they're real quiet. Yeah, and they're real reserved. Yeah. And compared to what that was like back in the day, I would have thought, well, man, they must really hate it or they must really hate being here. Yeah. And maybe sometimes they do. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, those particular times are the times when somebody will come up to me and be like, well, that really helped me. Yeah. You know, I was really thinking about that. And I do think that our church in particular has moved from more of that camp meeting style into more of like a like a thoughtful – Yes processing of yes. what's going on and that's good like i don't think that's a bad thing but it is harder for me in particular yeah to judge whether or not they received it well yeah. just yeah. because they're more Reserved. internal about internal, how they, yes. they, re yeah. they respond to it but, yeah that's a great distinction yeah. you know uh, again camp meeting can be a breath of fresh air but we need really some meat of the word you know um, meat of the word takes time to chew and digest. It's the true. milk of the word is easy to shout about and run about. Yeah. But it's the meat of the word, you know, that yeah. it takes some time. And I, I heard one man say it this way. Um, he said, Pastor, we can't shout when our mouth's full. Yeah, that's right. And so that's that's not a negative thing, but mm -hmm. it is harder to read the people. Um, and you can't ingest meat as fast as you can milk. Absolutely. I learned that in my personal life uh, yes. you got to chew it 